Let's talk about research methods in psychology. Psychologists can use several different types of methods. Experiments such as laboratory or field experiments, self-reports such as questionnaires and interviews, case studies which are detailed investigations of one person or a group of people over a long period of time. They can use observations, correlations, and even longitudinal studies. In an experiment, there are independent variables that are manipulated. We change them somehow or use them in different levels and compare across individuals. And these are measured with dependent variables. By putting in or imposing controls in the experiment, we are making sure that the independent variable is what is causing the change in the dependent variable. Or for example, which group, we're gonna isolate a variable um, and then we're gonna measure it. So by imposing the control or isolating a variable, we are in fact looking for a change in measurement compared to the other groups. And there are three different ways we can create or design, so we're creating these designs, of the independent variable. We have independent measures, which is basically each participant is allocated to a different level of the independent variable. So they only see one version of the experiment, and it, that version is not the same for every participant, just those in their group. In a repeated measures design, the participants are shown every level of the independent variable. They are the same group that is repeated through all the variables. And in a matched pairs design, participants are matched up to other participants in other independent variable groups. And there is usually one variable that we are trying to maintain consistency on across all levels. So maybe we match for age. So the mean age for everyone in group A is 35 years old and everyone in group B is also 35 years old. We could match for IQ and let's say group A has 110 as an IQ and group B also has 110 IQ. Now it can vary one or two points. Okay, it's, it is the mean average. Now in all types of experiments, it's really important to impose controls in order to raise the validity of the study. And the very most important type to control are confound variables. And a confound variable is something that is going to individually kind of attack or stick to one level of the independent variable. It's not going to be something that we see across all levels, but it's really important to control for that and not leave it as an uncontrolled variable because then our could change how we see the results of a study and we're not even going to know why until maybe possibly the study is replicated and then we find something different or we find different results because that variable was uncontrolled and we're never going to know what it was. Other types of uncontrolled variables are things that we can't control for like individual differences or personality type. We also want to look out for situational variables. These are things in our environment that could change the results of a study or the measurement of an independent variable. Now, other ways to measure data are going to involve some things like self-reports. Self-reports are interviews or questionnaires, and there are so many different varieties of ways that we can create these. With interviews, we can have structured or unstructured or semi-structured. With questionnaires, we could have closed questions, open questions, and the combination of these or having them separate by themselves could produce qualitative data, quantitative data, or a mixture of both. And both is always better Qualitative alone is really bad, and quantitative data is pretty good because it's structured. So we'll accept quantitative on its own, but qualitative by itself, it's never going to be that good. We'd have to have some pretty seriously good inter-rater reliability with that. Now we can also have different types of observations. We talked about having covert observations or overt observations. Those are being overly obvious and demand characteristics are going to be a lot higher in an overt versus a covert observation. We could have a structured observation where we have a checklist and we're just check, 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 check. And that is going to elicit quantitative data. 
But if we have an unstructured observation, we could just be looking up every five seconds and writing down what the participant is doing. And that's going to give us a lot more qualitative data. And then we have like naturalistic observations and that's like whatever happens, happens. And we have no control over anything that's going on and we don't know where it's going to go or what could happen next. And when doing something like that, it's really hard to prepare and have any structure at all to it. So the data could be all over the place and it's probably best to use that in something like a pilot study. Now we talked about experiments and those are mostly going to give us some type of causal effect, which is like cause and effect, but we haven't talked about correlations. And the number one thing that I say is correlations do not imply causations. So just because we figured out that two things are related somehow does not mean that one causes the other to happen. So with correlations, we are simply looking at two or more variables. We're looking at their measurements and we're trying to figure out, are they related or are they not related? And we find this relation with something called positive or negative correlations. And if something is positive, it just means that the data is moving in the same direction, whether it's going up or going down in a consistent way and a negative correlation. If you think about the negative side of magnets, trying to put them together, they want to push apart. And that is a negative correlation where one data might be going north and the other is going south. One's going positive and the other is going negative. Something else that is very important in correlational studies, I mean, it's pretty important in most all studies that have independent and dependent variables, is the operationalizing of those variables, which an operational definition is just a really, really, really defined and detailed description of either what we are looking for or what we are measuring. Okay, so now any really good research starts with a name, and then we have to create a testable hypothesis. We always have an alternative and a null, and null means that nothing is going to happen because we've never seen it before, or that alternative is the alternative to nothing happening, which is something happening. And we may predict this in a causal effect by doing a one-tailed hypothesis, or we may have no clue, like in correlations, and we may do a two-tailed hypothesis. You have to know what type of data you're going to collect. If it's qualitative data, if it's quantitative data, if it's quantitative, how are we going to measure it? Mean, median, or mode? Maybe we use a measurement of spread like standard deviation or range. How are we going to display the data? Are we going to use histograms, bar charts, scatter plots? And something that's really important that we don't always talk about is the ethics behind this. Is it going to be possible to be 100% ethical here? I'll say that protection from harm and confidentiality should be things that are always, always made sure of. Like, there's no reason to, to veer away from those. But when we're talking about deception and informed consent, that could literally make or break the study by imposing demand characteristics. Like, let's weigh our options here. Is it better to lie a little bit about the aim and have participants act more natural? Or tell them exactly what's going to happen and there be a possibility of demand characteristics that we'll never really know about, but we can just assume. And the two very most important methodological issues that we need to keep an eye out for or we need to make sure is in our study is reliability and validity. If the data in a study is too subjective, then that's going to harm our validity of our study. If the way that we're measuring participants can't be standardized or maybe it fluctuates, then that is going to put a damper on reliability. So at the end of the day, we've done this thing, we have our data. The most important thing now is how we count that data. Do we have good inter-rater reliability? And can we count on that data being present in the same exact way if we were to replicate the study again? Thank you so much for watching. If you need more on research methods in psychology, make sure to follow.